chapter 2. I invite you to turn there if you haven't already. Colossians chapter 2. I want to read the first 10 verses. Colossians chapter 2. For I want you to know what great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with per persuasive words, for though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. Started a series uh, last year, um, last year, last week, called uh, Wolves in Sheep's Clothing, and uh, concerned with this whole issue of social justice. Though I preached on social justice a few years ago, my concern specifically in this series of message has to do with social justice coming into many evangelical churches. You know, the prophets in the Old Testament, the apostles in the New Testament sounded warnings, warnings about false teaching, about idolatry. And so we are, it is incumbent upon us as pastors and leaders to warn where we see error and we see things coming into the church. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. You know, a wolf in sheep's clothing is dangerous, but a shepherd that strays is deadly because others will follow in his uh, way. Years ago, I read a book called The Gulag Archipelago by uh, uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. It was a book about the uh, Russian gulags, the prisons, and he was a Russian dissident. And he was forced to leave the Soviet Union, and his last message to the people of Russia was, live not by lies. Last Sunday, we looked at true justice, biblical justice. We saw that it's rooted in the person of God. It's revealed in the scriptures. We considered the fact that social justice ideology, what is coming about today, is a false message. John McWhorter calls it the cult of anti-racism. For some people, this has become a religion and they teach it and follow it with religious fervor. Last week I shared with you from Dr. Anthony Wood's outline of the uh, core beliefs of uh, the true gospel, that the, the true gospel of, of God is the biblical God, the biblical justice is opposite of what we're seeing today. And I wanna share with you his outline on uh, the ideology of social justice. Dr. Rod Dreyer says in his book, Live Not By Lies, a utopian vision drives these progressives, one that compels them to seek to rewrite history and reinvent language to reflect their ideals of social justice. So what are the tenets of this social justice ideology? Well, number one, there's no God. There is no God. Social justice ideology is steeped in the teaching of Marx. Marx hated God. Life is nothing but class warfare. This is a man-centered philosophy belief system. Erwin Lutzer, in his book, No Reason to Hide, says, worship has been transferred from God to us. A man-centered, man, in a sense, man worshiping himself, coming up with his own ideas and philosophies. Number two, there's no objective truth. There's no objective truth. The intersection of a person's lived experience is determined to what is true. This is called standpoint epistemology. Epistemology has to do with knowledge. Standpoint has the idea of where you stand and the point from which you stand and your perspective, particularly if you are a person from an oppressed group, you're the only one that can understand true racism. You're the only one that can see uh, uh, systemic racism. Though de Bauchum says, because of one's ethnicity, people are able to know if something is racist. And since I'm a white man, um, heterosexual man, I cannot and I don't have the ability to see this underlying systemic racism 
that is in our culture. Very similar to uh, what uh, Paul dealt with here in the book of Colossians in what was known then as Gnosticism. The Gnostics believed that they had a special intuitive knowledge. You know, Satan only has one bag and he pulls his same things out in every generation. He just marks them a little different, labels them a little different, but it definitely you can see the hand and the mind of Satan in all of this. Self now is substituted for the authority of God's word. This is all about the authority and sufficiency of scripture. Is scripture authoritative? Is scripture sufficient for us to understand culture, to understand uh, truth, and of course we believe it certainly is. Psalm 4.2 in the ESV says, how long will you love vain words and seek after lies? So there's no God, there's no objective truth, there's no original sin. The only original sin is racism, and that defines every white person. According to their view, all white people are racist, and we are all guilty of systemic racism, whether we know it or not. So you take a group of people and you basically outright condemn them with no hope of any kind of salvation. James Lindsay is an atheist, and I've been reading many things from James Lindsay for years. James Lindsay has said repeatedly, if I wanted to destroy the Christian church, I would introduce critical race theory and intersectionality and all of these woke ideologies because he says if you do that, you will fracture the church. And there's no personal identity, no personal identity. Everybody is, is, is defined by what ethnic group they're in. Every person, according to the Bible, is an image bearer of God. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. We are all image bearers of God. doesn't matter what our ethnicity is. Do you realize the idea of race is a man-centered construction? It's not true. You don't find race in the Bible. Now you find different ethnicity. We're all of one race, the human race. We all go back to Noah. We all go back to Adam and Eve. And the whole idea of different races is not something that came from the Lord. Every individual person has worth and value in the sight of God. That's why we are so anti-abortion, because that is a person with an eternal soul in the womb of the mother. You cannot reduce people to a group identity. And then there's no repentance. This just gets worse the farther you go. There's no repentance. Repentance has become penance, penance for whiteness. Okay, if I buy into this philosophy... That because I'm a, a white person, cisgendered, that means heterosexual, and uh, I buy into all this, um, and I feel bad about it, and I ask them, what should I do? There's nothing you can do. The only thing you do is perpetual penance, and you don't find that anywhere in Scripture. The idea of white privilege came from a paper written in 1989 by a lady named Packy, Peggy McIntosh, and she entitled it, White Privilege unpacking the invisible knapsack. And I've been listening to some very prominent evangelical pastors, the names that you would know, and I've heard more than one of them say, I have this invisible bag of privilege. That is critical race jargon. That's right out of that philosophy. Why are we consulting a godless philosophy to think that we have to understand culture or reach culture by using their theories. Jeremiah 7, 8 says, Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. You see, we do need to understand this wokeness. We do need to understand social justice ideology. And I've read many books and, and many things on the internet, and literally for years I've been studying this. I study it to understand it, not to adopt it. It's one thing to understand these things. It's, it's very different to endorse it or to adopt it, to think we have to use their language and you have to use their uh, philosophies and principles to find the truth. 2 Peter 1.3 says, As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. 
We do not need anything outside the Bible to understand the Bible. If people tell you, well, you need a reference outside the Bible to bring that to the Bible to understand the Bible, you're going to be led into serious, serious error. Some have made the statement, you have to see, the only way to understand the Bible is through the lens of racism. I mean, that's just a fault. That, you, the hiss of Satan is in that. The only thing you need to understand the Bible is the Holy Spirit that you receive at the time of your salvation. You don't need a godless ideology. If we think we have to reference material outside of the Bible to understand the Bible, we will be led into serious error. God's word is authoritative, God's word is sufficient, and God's word is final. Owen Strachan in his book, Christianity and Wokeness, says, Wokeness is not a prism by which we discover truths we couldn't see in a Christian worldview. Wokeness is a different system entirely than Christianity. These are two separate worldviews. Biblical Christianity is one worldview. All of this wokeness and social justice ideology is a whole different worldview. And you can't, you can't bring them together, and, and why would you? And that's what Paul talks about here in Colossians. And the worst thing is there's no savior. There's no savior. Without a savior, there's no salvation. There's no gospel. There's no repentance. There's no faith. It's a hopeless, graceless cult. And many pastors, evangelical pastors, are substituting cultural engagement for gospel proclamation. Do we need to know what's happening in culture? Yes, we do. But we need to see it through the lens of Scripture, not through the lens of this false, godless philosophy and ideology. 1 Timothy 4.1, now the Spirit expressly says in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. This is demonic. It comes from the mind of Satan. And I think many people fall into this and they mean well. Nobody wants to, I mean, most people, if you're a person of some kind of character, you don't, you don't want racism, you don't want prejudice, you don't want to think because you're of a different ethnicity or you're a different color that somehow one person is more valuable than the other. Segregation, Jim Crow laws, slavery, all that was wicked, it was ungodly, it was evil, it's in our history. We acknowledge that, but that doesn't necessarily define us today. Also, what you'll hear from many of these pastors is we have to widen the gospel. We have to widen the gospel. You know where that came from? That came from, in the 20th century, from the social uh, gospel. Uh, the, the, the practitioners of the social gospel said, we've got to widen the gospel. We've got to get involved with social things. And sooner or later, exactly what happened, you see it in the mainline churches right here in our own town. They, they've long ago stopped preaching the gospel. You don't need to widen the gospel. The gospel is the gospel, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ and all that that entails. So when you hear this kind of wording, it should cause a red flag to go up and to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. We don't add to the gospel. We don't take away from the gospel. We preach the pure gospel. 2 Corinthians 10.3 says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We pull down these false philosophies and ideologies by confronting them with the spiritual weapons that God has given to us, primarily the word of God. The word arguments in 2 Corinthians 10 is, is a Greek word, logismos. It means reasoning. It means thoughts. We see the reasoning of these false ideologies and the false philosophies, and then we apply biblical truth to that. That's how we attack. The, our weapons are spiritual weapons. Now, the first century church had to deal with their dangerous man-made philosophies. Ever since Acts chapter 2, when the church was born, I did to go back in the Old Testament with the people of God. Satan has always tried to infiltrate God's people, and he's always tried to infiltrate the church. And so Paul's letter to the church at Colossae gives us some good principles to look at when we are confronting false teaching. The false gospel in Paul's day had apparently spread to Laodicea, 
And he mentions that here in verse 1 of chapter 2. Laodicea was about 10 miles from Colossae. And so this error that had come into Colossae had apparently spread into Laodicea. It was a heresy that was denying the deity of Christ and denying also the humanity of Christ. It taught that Jesus was a created being. And some of that same philosophy and false teaching is around today. It's interesting when I did that series on the seven churches, uh, we looked at the church of Laodicea, and I don't know if you recall, but what we said was the church of Laodicea by that time was an apostate church. They were a church of unbelievers. So they were not as strong as the church at Colossae, who we will see Paul will commend them for standing for the truth, but apparently the church of Laodicea did not have strong believers in it. And so Paul here is emphasizing the importance of, look at verse 2. I want to read it in the New American Standard Bible because it brings it out better. Attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself. Paul wants the Colossian Christians to have a deep conviction concerning the truth of who Jesus is, concerning the truth of the gospel of Christ, he wants them to be anchored in that. That is the way to confront, in their day, the false philosophy of Gnosticism. In our day, the false philosophy of social justice. He says in verse 3, in whom, meaning Christ, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Did you see that? In him, in Christ. You need wisdom and knowledge? You'll find it in Christ. The word treasures is where we get our word for thesaurus. A thesaurus is a collection of, of words. So a collection of wisdom, a collection of knowledge is found in Jesus. We don't need to look other places. Now, we can look to see and understand a little bit about false philosophy. It's like satanic arts and, and satanic things in culture. It's okay to get a general knowledge, but never delve into that stuff. The way you could, all you need to know is, is in the Bible. And maybe you need to know a general thing to help people to get caught up in that. It's the same way with social justice ideology. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Jesus Christ. We don't need to look anywhere else. We need to focus on Jesus. Paul is a master teacher. He takes the word hidden here is where we get our word for apocrypha. Apocrypha is the, the false writings. We don't accept the apocrypha as part of the church, but that's that word. And so Paul takes their own vocabulary because the apocrypha for them, this word here, uh, hidden, hidden trade, is the idea that the Gnostic says. We, in our, we have this literature in which we have the, the hidden things that you, you, you can't know just by, by being a Christian and studying the Bible. You, you need us to come alongside, and it's the same thing we're hearing today. You can't understand systemic racism. Only we can do that. Uh, you, you know, Satan, he takes the same old tricks, and he repackages them for a new generation. The woke cult says that only a person from an oppressed group can have this intuitive knowledge of racism. And it's so similar to what Paul dealt with. That's why Vody Bauckham calls it ethnic Gnosticism. Well, how do, we, how do we defend against this? Well, Paul acknowledged the captivating power of false philosophies, first of all. We need to understand how powerful these philosophies are. You know, when I was younger and in school, I, they used to say, the pen is mightier than the sword. And I was like, I'm not going to attack you with a pen when I can attack you with a sword. And then as you get older, you begin to understand what that means. These philosophies have a way of, of taking root, and they change nations. Verse 4, now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. The word deceive means to reason alongside. These false teachers want to come alongside and they want to weave their false philosophies so they can deceive even believers. They use arguments with persuasive words. They first seem reasonable. But Paul, though the Laodicean church, apparently, eventually went into apostasy. The church of Colossae stood firm and Paul commends them. He uses military language and he commends them for holding the line. 
And so that's my challenge to Grace Bible Church. Hold the line. Look at verse 5. For though I'm absent in the flesh, yet I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. The word order is a military term that was used for a orderly formation of disciplined troops. And then he strengthens it by using the word steadfastness, which signifies an unbroken rank of soldiers. So the picture is a military picture where you have the enemy coming and you have these disciplined troops and they are in an unbroken rank as they are facing the enemy. And Paul uses that to commend the church at Colossae. He says, you're standing firm. You're holding the line. Tragically, some evangelical pastors are appearing to dialogue with social justice ideology rather than to confront its error. So Paul revealed the conquering power over false philosophy. So what do we do? They're so persuasive, and we certainly see that in our day. Look at verses 6 and 7. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Now, Paul here, when you study the book of Colossians, he's actually attacking two form, primary forms of the Gnosticism of his day. The Gnostics denied the humanity of Jesus. They denied the deity of Jesus. But his points are for every Christian in every generation of the church age because Satan is still attacking the church in much the same way today. So we have the power to defeat that. He mentions two things. Number one, our salvation. Our salvation. He says, as you have received Christ Jesus. That's our salvation. So number one, this is why we preach the gospel. This is why we challenge you about your salvation. This is why we want to know every Sunday, do you know for sure if you died today, you would go to heaven? Because that's point number one. That's first base, to know the Lord as your Lord and Savior. But then he talks about sanctification. Sanctification means to be set apart. It's another word for Christian growth. We become a Christian, and then we grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. He talks about that here. He says, build up in him. And this is in the the original language. It means continually build up. We'll never stop being sanctified till we get to heaven. It is a lifelong process for a Christian once they are saved until the Lord takes them home. The more we are grounded, look at the word rooted. That's a very picturesque word. In the things we have been taught, we will become established in the faith. You know, Peter even points this out in one of his epistles. I want to remind you. So much of what we preach is reminding you. Not that we don't, uh, usually when I hear a sermon, I usually hear something that I either I didn't know or I maybe had forgotten or I need to be reminded. So much of what we do is reminding, is reinforcing. It's rooting us. It's grounding us. One commentator says, permanently rooted in Christ and firmly anchored in him. That's a good summary permanently rooted in Christ, firmly anchored in him. Are you firmly anchored in Christ? Do you know what you believe and believe what you know? Do, do, do you, are you grounded in the faith so that when someone comes to you or some false philosophy or ideology like we're facing today, and, and, and right away there's certain things, they might sound pretty good, but wait a minute, some flags go up. Something, something doesn't sound right about this. This this doesn't square with with what I've learned in the Word of God. I'm sure you've heard this illustration before, but they say when they're training uh, people in the government to, you know, to detect counterfeit bills, they don't study the counterfeit, they study the original. They get to know the original so well that when the counterfeit comes in front of them, they can immediately recognize it. And I think that's kind of what Paul's saying. Man, get grounded in the Word. Get grounded in your faith. Believe what you know and know what you believe. And so when some cult knocks at your door or this false philosophy comes across the airways or on the internet and you begin to, to, to read it and think about it and, and the Holy Spirit begins to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's something very wrong here with this. We should be very thankful and continually thankful that we know the truth. 
because so many people in this culture are being totally deceived. The worldview that undergirds critical race theory is in direct conflict with the word of God. So in verse 8, Paul reveals the sources of these false philosophies because they're the same sources today that they were in Paul's day. Verse 8, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, not according to Christ. If you have an ESV, English Standard Version, it translates it as takes you captive, which is a better rendering. You see, we're not supposed to let these false ideologies take us captive. We're to take them captive. We take them captive through understanding the word of God. And Christians and churches are always in danger of being deceived by man-made philosophies that are vain delusions. The word philosophy means love or pursuit of wisdom, and that's a good thing. But when it's man-centered wisdom, then that leads into error and deception. And the church has always faced the danger of infiltration by deceptive error. This is nothing new. Every generation has to face some kind of challenge, and this is our challenge. So, Paul reveals the source of these false philosophies. First of all, they're based on man-made traditions. Man-made traditions. The word tradition means a handing down. So these precepts, these ideologies originate in men's minds. They, They float them as false philosophies, their own philosophies. And then others pick them up and they're handed down from one generation to the next. You hear a lot about the term woke. Well, what exactly does that mean? What? What is woke? Well, it's the idea that you become awake. You become awake to the true condition of things while others are asleep. Awake to what? Systemic racism. Awake to the fact that all white people are racist. And white people can't know they're racist. They can't see it, but they're guilty of it. And there's no repentance. There's no salvation. They want to paint us in a box. So what we have to do is do penance, continual penance. This whole idea of reparations, it comes from that same philosophy. It's an ongoing penance, which would be never-ending because there's no repentance, there's no forgiveness, there's no salvation, there's no grace. And my God is a God of grace. You see, all this wokeness traces its ultimate roots roots to Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, the writers of the Communist Manifesto. These have been developed over the years. They've been added to and changed, and so now it's evolved into what many call cultural Marxism. Francis Schaeffer said years ago, man cannot begin with himself and arrive at ultimate reality. Man cannot begin with himself and arrive at ultimate reality. You're not going to find truth when it's you begin with yourself. And you leave God out of the equation. Secondly, they're founded upon worldly principles. Worldly principles. Paul says basic principles. In the original language, that's literally things in a row. It's sort of like ABCs. It's like when you go to kindergarten and you learn basic things. That's what Paul is, is saying here. He's saying their core fault, the core of these false philosophies are infantile. They're simplistic. They might sound very sophisticated and very erudite, but when you get down to it, they're silly, they're childish. Think about that. Because you're a white person, you are guilty of systemic racism. You may not know it. In fact, you can't really know it because you have to be from an oppressed group to know it. And so we're going to tell you about it, and we're going to claim that you're guilty, not just even as individuals, but by a whole group, you're guilty But there's no hope for you because there's no repentance, only penance. 1 Corinthians 3.19, Paul says, The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Milton Friedman says, A society that puts equality in the sense of equality of outcome ahead of freedom will end up with neither equality nor freedom. We certainly are in a neo-pagan culture, a pre-totalitarian culture. And if things don't change, that's where we are headed. And then they are Christless. 
These philosophies are Christless. Paul says, not according to Christ. And that's why all man-made ideologies ultimately fail. You know, the Russian Revolution, they thought it was going to end up in this great utopia. And what did they get? Mass murder, gulags. Same thing with Hitler in Germany. All these man-made philosophies fail. They're based upon lies. G.K. Chesterton wrote, The tragedy of disbelieving in God is not that a person ends up believing in nothing. Alas, it is much worse. A person may end up believing in anything. And boy, you see that down through history, and you see it in our day. One prominent evangelical pastor, and I, I heard him say this, the CRT can be a tool that we Christians can use to understand what's happening in our culture and apply it. Why in the world would you want to use a Christless, hopeless, satanic philosophy, understand it, confront it, but never adopt it or use it? Paul says it's Jesus, not philosophy. It's Jesus, not philosophy. Verses 9 and 10, because in him, Jesus... Dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You are complete in him. He is the head of all principality and power. I mean, where do you go? I mean, he's the boss. He's the man. He's in charge. In him we find everything we need. He's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He came and he lived the sinless life we could not live. He died on the cross for you, for me. He took God's punishment, was buried, rose again the third day, gave some instructions to his disciples, ascended bodily, physically to heaven. And he's bodily, physically coming back again one day. This is the Jesus whom we serve. This world is a mess. It's always been a mess. One day he's going to come back and he's going to make it an incredible, wonderful place to be. God has revealed himself both in his word and in his son, the human philosophies of Paul's day, the human philosophies of our day, teach that Jesus is neither God nor is Jesus the source of all truth. So you have a choice. Young people, you have a choice. You can listen to the philosophies of the world. You can believe the Bible or you can not believe the Bible. But all you have to do, read a little bit of history. Just look around. Look at the nations that have adopted a godless socialism or Marxism or communism. They have all failed and this cost the lives of millions, even billions of people because of totalitarianism that sets aside God. And we need to pray for our country because we are headed in that direction. Someone I read said, we are living right now in what he called a soft totalitarianism but a soft totalitarianism will eventually lead to a hard totalitarianism. Well, they will come into our church and say, you can't preach that anymore. That's bigoted. You can't say homosexuality is sin. You can't say transgender is sin. You can't preach that kind of stuff. We're not gonna, we're not gonna put up with that. And we think, don't we? Well, that could never happen here. Well, it very well could. So we need to pray for our country. We need to stand for truth. And there are some crucial questions in closing we need to ask ourselves. Number one, do I have assurance of my salvation? Let's get down to personal. Do I have assurance of my salvation? That's why every Sunday we often say, almost every Sunday, do you know that you know if you died today you'd go to heaven? The Bible says these things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. Do you know you have eternal life? Do you know that? And if you think you're going to heaven, what's, what do you base that on? Is it the gospel? 2 Peter 1.10, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. Number two, am I established in the faith? Am I established in the faith? Is, is this my faith or is this a nominal faith? I'm just a Christian because my parents are Christians and I go to Grace and it's a Christian church. And I'm not Muslim. I'm not Jewish. So I guess I'm Christian. But is this your faith? And am I praying and asking the Lord for wisdom and discernment? James 1.5 says, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally. And he won't upbraid, meaning he won't chide us for coming to him repeatedly 
and asking for wisdom. If we ever needed wisdom, this is the time we do. And as I said last Sunday, and I, I challenged the pastors and deacons with this, and I challenged the, the membership, when someone stands up here and you question him, don't be afraid to ask some hard questions. Don't be afraid to ask, what's your, what's your take on social justice? How do, you, how do you view this whole thing that's happening in culture? Because I'm telling you, this is becoming insidious. And many good, godly men, and I think they mean well, but they're being led astray. Just like back in the social justice movement. Everybody wants to help people. We want to help poor people. But it got to the point where that became the focus, and they lost the focus of the gospel. When you lose the focus of the gospel, you will eventually lose the gospel. I mean, that's a historical fact. And though we are concerned about racism, we love everybody... You know, at the end in Revelation, there's somebody from every ethnic group is going to be in heaven. There's no racism in heaven. There'll be no segregation. And in God's eyes, he's no respecter of persons. So we love everybody. But at the same time, we have to confront false ideologies and understand what's behind all this. And it's, it's Satan, again, working his, his way. He hates America because we, there are many Christians in America, and America stood by Israel. That's two reasons he hates America, and he would love to see this country fall. And we send out so many missionaries around the world. So God bless you. Let's just be praying. We are praying every Saturday. We're praying all the time. Lord, send us the right man who will continue the legacy of preaching the truth and focus on the gospel and continue to lead Grace Bible Church to follow you.